All the classical vocalists I know call him Dustruffle instead of Durufle. I'm the classical nerd, and today we're talking about Maurice Dustruffle. <clears throat> Durufle. Durufle was born in 1902 in northern France, where as an adolescent he became involved in church music. The rituals of the Catholic Mass also entranced him. They cast a spell over him, his words. While a great many details of his life remain unclear due to his very guarded nature, we do know that he became involved in playing the organ, where his first big-name teacher was Charles Tunemer. Tunemer? Tun These French names get me. Durufle always respected his teacher, but the respect was not necessarily mutual. Tunemer was known to complain about Durufle to everyone, including Durufle himself. They appear to have had different personalities which manifested in different musical philosophies. His organ studies led him to, well, where else, the Prix Conservatoire, where he would graduate with very high marks. Durufle would become a full-time organist in Paris and made friends with the instrument's elites in that city, including a fellow named Louis Vierne. The two got along famously, with Vierne calling Durufle the most brilliant and the most original of the young generation of organists. Vierne was to meet his demise rather horrifyingly while playing the organ in the Cathedral of Notre Dame, and Durufle was right next to him when that happened, presumably helping him to work the stops. Durufle studied with a laundry list of great organists, but there are a few really weird aberrations. For one thing, he had taken some lessons with Charles-Marie Vidor, who counted Durufle amongst his students. But Durufle always denied that he had taken lessons from Vidor, saying that he had taken them from his student Paul Ducasse instead. The why is really mysterious. They don't appear to have had any hard feelings towards the other. Anyway, Durufle's star was rising, and he was sought after to give advice on the registration of various pieces. As an academic, Durufle was hired by the Conservatoire in 1943 to teach harmony, and it was during his time at that institution where he produced his most famous work a setting of the Catholic Requiem Mass. Published as his Opus 9, the Requiem follows in the footsteps of several prior French settings, in its notable omissions. It seems to follow the structure of the Requiem written by Gabriel Faure. As far as Requiems go, Tarouflet's had a pretty weird inception. It was actually commissioned by Vichy France in order to push back against the more secular values of the government in exile. As a result, the church became quite reviled when France was liberated from the Nazi collaborating government's rule. The Vichy government attempted to endear itself to the French citizens by providing basically unemployment benefits, and commissions to various out-of-work composers helped them to basically pay the bills. It wasn't much, but it was a bit of a stipend. The Requiem exists in several different versions when it comes to the particulars of the instrumentation. Nowadays, it's either performed in its most basic reduced version for choir and organ, or is one that also features a small chamber orchestra or string ensemble. Yet the Requiem is also a mystery. It's expertly set for voices, yet came from the pen of a composer who had theretofore written no vocal music whatsoever. Not only that, but Paris was not known for great choral music. It did not have a well-established choral tradition at that point in time. We do know that he consulted experts in Gregorian chant throughout the entire compositional process, imbuing the piece with a sense of antiquity. The Requiem would become de Rufle's compositional calling card, which was a good thing for him because he really didn't write all that much. But like other slow-working composers like Paul Ducasse or Gerald Finzi, what we do have is meticulously crafted and really highly wrought music. No note is even close to out of place in any de Rufle work and he only wrote 19 of them by my count. He was fascinated by architecture from a young age. His father and his brother had gone into architecture, and it's very clear that he thought of music in those terms. In any event, in 1947, the same year as the Requiem's premiere, he met Marie-Madeleine Chevalier, who had been hired as his assistant. They fell in love and married six years later, becoming a one-two punch organ duo. She took the flashier and much more virtuosic stuff, while he stuck to things that highlighted his interpretive skill. Their partnership was fruitful and incredibly mutually beneficial. Neither one could have reached the heights of their respective careers without the other. Durufle continued teaching at the Conservatoire, always biking to school in his trademark hat. He didn't appear to be a mean professor, but he was quite strict in the assignments that he levied. 
Unlike the turn-of-the-century conservatoire, Drifley was keen to include everyone from Bach to Debussy in his classes, and ear training meant going away from the instrument and working on one's inner ear. He retired from the conservatoire in 1970, and five years later got into a horrible car wreck which ended his performing career but not his life. A drunk driver slammed into his car going at 93 miles an hour, killing the culprit instantaneously and launching Drufle out onto the highway. Marie Madeleine was injured as well, though not nearly as badly. She just had broken bones all over her body. Once she recovered, she took over his organ duties at his church, but he was so injured that she would later say that he would have been better off if he had been killed in the accident. He passed away in 1986 at the age of 84. Drufle was a throwback to the days of Gregorian plain chant in the heyday of atonality, though even he would come to see the Gregorian influence as perhaps outsized. Nevertheless, he loved Debussy and Ravel, disregarding some conservatives like Faure. Though unopposed to Vatican II, he hated the simplified direction of Catholic church music, and would rather have had the church adopt Protestant forms in order to retain a higher quality of musicianship. These high standards would come to haunt him in the later years of his life, as he expressed much regret for not having written more music. But what we do have is lush, and it's wonderful, and it's entirely his own, as if a look into a parallel universe where plain chant exerted an influence over all of Romanticism.